All right, hi everyone. I hope you guys are having a good day. So, first of all, we have several announcements this week. So, after this lecture video, you will have exam one. So, exam one is going to be released on February 6th at noon, so it's 12 p.m. Um, every semester I have someone get confused, so make sure you note that it's noon, 12 p.m., that the exam is going to be released, and also noon, 12 p.m., that's going to be due. So, it's going to be due on February 13th at noon. So the exam will be open for a week. You can take it at any point during that time. And I will also be posting a review video for you to watch. And that will talk more about the format of the exam. But if you have questions, please feel free to come by and let me know. So what I recommend that you do is to watch this lecture video, do activity three. So you do have an activity this week due by Friday at 5 p.m. And then after that, start preparing for the exam. Start studying, watch the review video, and as you feel confident, go ahead and take the practice exam. Now you'll notice that there's a practice exam that's going to be released and it's going to close at the same time as the regular exam. It's just going to be eight questions that are similar to the kinds of questions you'll see on the test. So you can use that to help you prepare as well as to get a little bit of extra credit. Okay? So watch this video, do the activity, start to study, watch the review video, take the practice exam for extra credit, and then take the regular exam. Now you'll have 75 minutes to take it. It'll be multiple choice, true, false, and matching. And you will need to take it in one session. So once you start taking it, um, make sure you're prepared to finish it. If you receive accommodations, please send me an email and let me know how you would like to handle that. Okay. Um, so this week we're going to be talking about Adler. This is the last lecture before exam one. So Adler's theories are going to be relatively different from the theories of Freud that we talked about last week. Um, so some of you in your activities made me believe that you were ready for something that was a little bit different from Freud. So be prepared for that today. We're going to talk about Adler today. We're going to talk about his theories of personality. So just let me know if you have any questions. I have office hours on Monday, Wednesday, Fridays from 8 to 8.50. So you can come by during that time. Now one thing to note is that I will not have my usual office hours on February 13th because I will be out of town with my daughter. Um, she has some specialist appointments. Other than that, though, I'll be in my office this week during my usual office hours, so just let me know if you have any questions. Otherwise, we're going to go ahead and get into lecture for today. All right, so as I said, today we're going to be discussing the theories of Alfred Adler. Now, one thing you will note is that because Freud's theories are relatively well known, and because Freud is probably the person that comes to mind when we talk about psychology, often other theorists are compared to Freud. So throughout the semester, you might see slides where we're talking about how this theorist was very similar to Freud, how they built on Freud's theory. At other times, you'll see theorists who were fairly opposed to Freud. So today, when we talk about Adler, we're going to be talking about an individual who initially was friends with Freud and believed what Freud believed, and then later on split from Freud and had a theory of personality that was fairly different from Freud's. So, first of all, it says that Adler was optimistic and emphasized social interest. So he had a relatively positive view of mankind, and he believed that we are influenced by nurture, by our relationships. You're going to see this term social interest several times today, but it's the idea that one of the most important things that we can do is to have healthy relationships and be at one with humanity. So Freud would have really emphasized those unconscious factors that perhaps we didn't have any control over. So then, based on Freud's theory, your social relationships probably were less of a factor because most of what you are is unconscious and internal to you. On the other hand, Adler would say that your relationships with other people are very influential for you, and not just necessarily with one-on-one -on -one relationships, but relationships with humanity at large. So he differed from Freud in several ways, four in particular. It says people are motivated by social influences, striving for superiority or success. So you will see this later on in the lecture that people tend to either try to find success in themselves or success in their relationships with other people, and we'll touch back on that. People are responsible for who they are, so Adler would say that we have at least some control over our behavior and over our personality, which means then that we are responsible for our behavior. It's not so much like we have unconscious desires, like the id that's kind of out of control, as Freud might say, but rather that although we might not be able to control the biological hand that we're dealt or the environment necessarily that we're born into, we are still are responsible for what we do with what we're given. Right? 
Um, and Adler emphasized consciousness. It's not that Adler disagree with Freud in that there is an co- unconsciousness. So Adler would say, yes, there is an unconscious part of your personality. But Adler would say that your unconscious and your conscious are working together. Have they have the same goals? And so there's not as much conflict as there would be in Freud's theory. Okay. Now, briefly talking about a biography of Adler. Adler, it says he was the second son of a middle-class Jewish parent. Something important to note here. We're going to be talking about birth order later. Adler was the second son. The firstborn child was also a son. Um, and his older brother was a very healthy, athletic individual. Adler, on the other hand, had lifelong health issues. And so you're going to see that Adler's health struggles played a role in his theory of personality, as well as the fact that he had an older brother that he felt this very intense rivalry with. And so that's going to be something that's important to note. You're going to see that he published a study on organ inferiority. We're going to talk about this coming up. But the idea that people who have health issues then are at a greater risk for having feelings of inferiority, which then can lead to psychological illness. So we'll talk about that. He was part of Freud's organization, but he ended up splitting from Freud. And when you hear individual psychology, this is often referring to Adler here. He had a different kind of theory than Freud. So as an overview slide, we're going to be talking through and talking about each one of these in detail. But it says striving for success is the force behind our behavior. You're going to see that. Subjective perceptions shape our behavior, so not so much a realistic view of the world per se, but more the idea that... Your, who you are and what you believe to be true is more important to you. That your view of the world, based on your perspective, is the only view that you have. And so it might not be as important what is actually true. It's more important what you believe to be true. And that's what's going to influence your behavior. Adler would say personality is unified and self-consistent, so even if we have various parts of our personality, they're all working towards the same goals, so there shouldn't be much conflict there. The value of all activity from a social interest perspective, so once again, focusing on nurture, focusing on relationships, not just one-on-one relationships, but with society at large. Um, It says personality structure becomes one style of life, so we're going to talk about style of life shortly. And it says that your style of life is molded by creative power, once again referring to that idea that we do have at least somewhat of a control over our own behavior and personality. Very good. All right, so starting off, striving for success or superiority. Adler would say that all individuals are striving for something, right? This is the final goal of our behavior. We want to be either successful or we want to be superior. Now, notice that these two things are a little bit different. So when we're talking about personal superiority, this comes from unhealthy individuals. So someone who is like psychologically ill, Adler would say they tend to focus more on themselves and not on other people. So they want to be successful at the expense of other people. They don't mind putting other people down to try to get themselves in a position of authority or where they feel like they are successful. On the other hand, it says that when people strive for success, when Adler talked about this, what he meant was healthy individuals, um, psychologically well persons who are trying to be successful, yes, for themselves, but also for humanity. Not just so that they can be successful and they don't care who they have to step on to get there and they don't care how it impacts other people, but more that they want to be successful and they also want all of humankind to be successful, right? So Adler would say that it's a perfectly normal part of being human to always feel like you're striving for something. But if you are striving only for something that benefits yourself, then that's a sign of of psychological issues there, right? Now, when you see compensation here, this is the idea that all individuals are born feeling inferior. So that children, especially being under the authority of parents or guardians and children being born weaker and smaller, are born with this feeling of inferiority that they feel like they have to try to overcome. They have to try to compensate for that feeling of inferiority by trying to become successful and that it makes us a little bit more likely to to have a drive and to have motivation. So when we're talking about subjective perceptions here, what I mentioned earlier about your own personal way of looking at the world being the thing that impacts you most, um, 
Adler used the term fictionalism or final goal here. When he's talking about this final goal, what he means is what you're really expecting to happen in the future, right? The fiction here is that you have beliefs and expectations about what are going, what's going to happen in the future. Now that is fiction. It hasn't happened yet and it might not happen at all, but that doesn't necessarily matter. It's not so much what's really going to happen that impacts who you are and what you're going to do. Rather, the expectations that you have, what you think will happen is what influences you and we know this to be true if we think about it this is where self-fulfilling prophecies come in um, I'm not sure if I've mentioned this term yet this semester but a self-fulfilling prophecy is the idea that someone believes something to be true and then because they believe it will be true they behave in ways that make it come true right so just to give a simple example here let's say that you met a new co-worker and you didn't like that person and you thought they were not a nice person they could be a perfectly nice person. You don't know that. But you believe they're not nice. So then if you believe a person is not nice, how are you going to behave towards them? Well, you're probably going to avoid them or not talk to them or just not be very friendly. Well, if you behave that way, you might end up making that person treat you as if they're not a nice person. You can see that we've created a self-fulfilling prophecy. Well, self-fulfilling prophecies are not always negative. If you believe that you're going to be successful, then you're more likely to behave in ways that will eventually make you successful. It's the idea that what you believe is going to happen powerfully impacts what you do and what you believe, and that's important, right? So our subjective perception is very important here, and it says that it gives unity to our personality so that all of our personality aspects, whether it's conscious or unconscious, are working together towards the same goal, whatever it is that we're trying to achieve in life. And this is going to guide our style of life. We're going to come back to style of life in a second, but style of life is very similar to personality. As you're going to see later the flavor of our life. We're going to come back to that. And so then all of our behavior is purposeful. Even if sometimes we don't realize why we're doing something, there's always a reason behind our behavior. Because if it's unconscious or conscious, we're working towards this goal based on what we expect will happen in our lives. Right? Now, once again, physical inferiorities plays a role here in our subjective perceptions. Remember that Adler had health issues. And once again, we know that our theories of personality are influenced by our own personal experiences. So if we perceive ourselves to be especially inferior, then we're more likely to try to overcome that, to try to compensate for that, and maybe even to try to compensate for that in ways that are not healthy. So all individuals, according to Adler, are born physically inferior. I mean, babies can't do anything for themselves. But we're going to see later that individuals who are born with health issues are even more likely to feel this physical inferiority and then more likely to try to compensate for that, right? But Adler would say that physical inferiority is not a bad thing, that it's actually, in Adler's terms, a blessing because this feeling of inferiority drives us to try to be successful, and this says towards perfection. And, of course, we know that perfection is an impossible goal, and it's not healthy for an individual to be too obsessed with perfection, but we do need to have high standards for ourselves. We do need to set goals. And Adler would say that if we are born with what we would consider without physical inferiorities or someone who is very healthy and someone who sees themselves as very strong, we would never feel a need to achieve more. We would never feel that drive. So Adler would say physical inferiority happens to all of us in some measure and that that's not necessarily a bad thing. Okay. Now, as we've already touched on, Adler would say that your personality is unified, that your conscious and your unconscious are working together so that even the behavior that you don't know why you're doing it, even if it's kind of unconsciously driven, it's going to be trying to pursue a goal that is in line with what your conscious is thinking. So there's not going to be a lot of conflict here in most individuals. All of our goals are going to be met by a combination of the conscious and unconscious. So Adler did believe there was an unconscious side to our personality but he didn't think it was as big of a deal as Freud was. He really believed that the conscious was most important and that the unconscious kind of supported or went along with the same goals as the conscious. Okay, so social interest being one of the most important terms in Adler's theory here. It says the force that binds society together. It's absolutely important. And a basic definition of social interest here is a feeling of being at one with humanity, right? Now, we know that for some individuals, social relationships seem to be more important than others. So where does this come from? 
Well, Adler would say that everyone is born with a predisposition towards social interest. In other words, everyone is born naturally desiring relationship, naturally wanting to be at harmony with other people. However, whether or not that is fostered plays a role in whether someone develops social interest or not. Now, you're going to see that social interest is very important. According to Adler, people who had underdeveloped senses of social interest are they're going to be the people who have psychological illness. So it's going to be very important for someone to have a high level of social interest. Now, Adler would say this is particularly important in mother-infant relationships, especially mother-infant um, or a mother-figure relationship, although with parents in general is important and with other people in your environment that are important there as well. So the idea being that people teach you to look out for other people, to care about your relationships, how to resolve conflict, for example. And so in a healthy environment with a healthy parent-child relationship, a child is likely to develop a high level of social interest, according to Adler. And then that makes a person more likely to have good psychological health and to be a mature person, right? So Adler went so far as to say this is the sole criterion of human values and the barometer of normality. Social interest is very important. So then individuals who are struggling or having psychological issues, probably the people who are coming to seek therapy are the ones that need help building up this social interest. Now, one thing you'll note here is that it may be that the relationships that you had with your parents or with other people in your environment might have hindered the development of your social interest. But that doesn't necessarily mean then that you were broken and cannot be fixed, right? We're going to see that Adler believed we had some control over this, okay? But more on that in a second. So when we talk about the style of life, it says it's the flavor of a person's life. It includes your goals, what you want out of life, your definition of success, for example. And we all have different definitions of success. Um, Self-concept. Your self-concept really has to do with all the things that make you who you are in your own opinion, right? Personality characteristics, maybe you feel like you're intelligent, you feel like you're outgoing, you feel like you're kind, right? You have a self-concept. Empathy, being able to understand other people, being able to feel their emotions, and your general attitude towards the world and towards other people, all of these things are part of your style of life. So this term style of life is very similar to personality, right? If it includes your goals and what you think of yourself and what you think of other people and your attitude towards life, that's very much related to your personality. Now, Adler would say that your style of life is a product of heredity. So here we're talking about nature. We're talking about genetic predispositions. And we know that certain parts of our personality are at least somewhat genetic, right? That there are some ways in which we are like our parents because we receive their genetics. Environment is also important. The parenting we received, the peers that we have, the neighborhood that we grew up in, even the time period that we grew up in is important. And creative power, which we're going to come back to on the next slide, but that's going to be your ability to change things a little bit here. So this is hopeful for most people here, right? Even if you didn't have perfect genetics and even if you didn't have a perfect environment, you still do have some control according to Adler. Now, Adler would say, and this is something that Freud would likely agree on here, that your style of life is set early on in life. So it says mostly set by four or five. However, notice mostly, there's going to be some flexibility here, okay? Really, your style of life is your manner of striving. It's your way of trying to reach your goals in life. And although maybe this is set in some ways, we know this does change over time we do have a little bit of flexibility here. So a healthy individual is someone who then is going to have this style of life and they're going to try to use their own personality to have successful relationships. It says neighborly relationships, friendships, sexual relationships, um, close personal romantic relationships, um, and a job, a uh, purpose in life, um, relationships with coworkers and boss. You're going to try to use your style of life to make connections with other people. Now, creative power is referring to this bit that we've mentioned before, that we do have some freedom to change who we are and what we do, right? It says that an inner freedom that empowers each person to create his or her own style of life. So you get to choose your personality and your behaviors a little bit. Now, I keep saying personality and behaviors together. Typically, when I talk to students, we feel like we have less control over our personality, but we feel like we have more control over our behaviors. But we could probably think of examples in which we, situations where we don't have 
complete control over our behaviors. And perhaps if we control our behaviors and we do certain behaviors long enough, then maybe that would become part of our personality or could change our personality. There's definitely a relationship there, right? But it says that it places one in control of his or her life. Now, something that's important here is that individuals who are psychologically healthy do have creative power, but also individuals who are psychologically unhealthy have creative powers. Now, on the one hand, that's good news. Someone who is having psychological issues, according to Adler, still has the ability to be flexible and to change that. That's good news. On the other hand, though, if you think about it that way, it almost makes us feel like psychological issues are our responsibility. It kind of puts us in the driver's seat where, as it says, it's not an endowment or what we've been given that's as important. It's what we do with it. And this is important, but I want to be cautious here describing this theory. I know that we have all had difficult experiences in our lives, and this is in no way intending to try to minimize the effects of those, but rather Sometimes we go through things in life that we should never have had to go through, but we do still have to decide what to do with that. And so ther therapy is a great place um, to work on that, okay? But then Adler would say, you are responsible for your goal. You're responsible for setting a goal that is appropriate and healthy and not just focused on yourself. And then you're responsible for trying to meet that goal in a way that once again is healthy and doesn't require you to step on other people to get to where you want to go. It says this contributes to the development of one's social interests. So if you have creative power, you have some flexibility and some freedom to be able to change your personality a little bit, to make yourself who you want to be, and to try to make yourself one who feels at, at one or comfortable with other people, someone who's comfortable with relationships. Alder would say that we have a responsibility to try to develop that in ourselves. Okay. Now, of course, we know that individuals, some individuals are psychologically healthier than others. Some individuals struggle. And once again, with absolute clarity here, I want to state that I have anxiety disorder and I have no judgment on other people who struggle at all. But Adler would say that sometimes we have abnormal development here. Now, when Adler was talking about abnormal development here, he was mainly talking about someone who had inappropriate underdeveloped social interest here. So someone who perhaps did not focus on other people at all and was not focused on relationships. So a few different things could lead to this according to Adler. For one, it says exaggerated physical deficiencies. So this is the idea that we are all born with an inferiority complex. We are all dependent on other people when we're children. But someone who has health issues is someone who's more likely to feel inferior and more likely to feel dependent. So then, if this is the case, this does not mean that a health issue causes abnormal development psychologically. That's not what it's saying. But what it is saying is that there's a relationship between health issues, physical deficiencies, and feeling inferior. Those feelings of inferior their feelings of inferiority or feeling as if you are inferior then can lead people to compensate in ways that is harmful to them psychologically. So it's not that health issues directly cause abnormal development, it's that they cause feelings of inferiority which then can lead to abnormal development, right? So Alder would say people who have exaggerated physical deficiencies are ones who are at risk for potentially having psychological issues. Also, people who have a pampered style of life, this is going to come back up again shortly when we talk about birth order, but someone who has a pampered style of life, someone who has maybe always had the world brought to them on a silver platter, this is a person who probably will not have very high social interests. They probably won't be so much worried about other people. And Adler would suggest then that the person who did the pampering, and according to Adler, this is often a mother figure, the person who did the pampering will then become excessively important to the individual more so than anyone else. So that this person, I'm going to use Adler's term here, the person might try to develop a permanent parasitic relationship with mom. In other words, someone who is not able to separate from a mother and that that relationship becomes excessively important right, at the risk of other relationships as well. Now, a neglected style of life, as we might imagine someone who has not had their needs met, is, of course, at risk for psychological issues for sure. 
Uh, but these individuals then are probably going to have trust issues, and they might withdraw. We're going to talk about withdrawal in a second, but they might not be interested in developing relationships because of um, their trust issues. So Adler would say these are a few of the situations in which people might have psychological issues. So what are we going to do to try to maintain our own self-esteem? We know that feeling good about ourselves and maintaining our self-concept is important. Remember that our self-concept, according to Adler, is part of our style of life. It's an important part of our personality. We all, though, have found ourselves in situations where what we believe and what we say, who we say we are, is not lining up with what we see ourselves doing. And in that situation, it feels very uncomfortable. So what are we going to do to try to help ourselves feel better, even if we see that we're not really who we think we are or who we want to be? Adler would say a few different ways that we do this. Sometimes we do this with excuses. Perhaps you know this person, or perhaps you are this person that tends to make excuses. I would be this, but I can't because of the parenting that I received or because of any other factor that you can think of here. We can come up with excuses. And at a certain level, this is okay because we do need to be able to sleep at night. If we blamed everything on ourselves, we would be depressed all the time. The problem is that someone who makes excuses excessively is not someone who understands the true cause of their problems, and then in that situation probably won't be able to fix it. If you don't understand why you have a problem, you probably won't be able to fix it. Right? Other would say other things that happen, sometimes people are aggressive to try to maintain their self-concept. And we think of this as maybe bullying or we see someone who is jealous of someone else and they don't like having other people being praised, that kind of thing. So they could become aggressive, they can lash out at people. This could be an actual physical aggression, it could also be kind of a relational aggression, gossiping, rumors. Um, and one thing that Adler would emphasize here is like putting down other people's accomplishments, right? Kind of deprecating other people like, okay, that's not a big deal, whatever success you had. Um, trying to make other people feel bad about themselves. Probably we have all had experiences with people who try to make other people feel bad. And we think, well, maybe they're just trying to do that to build themselves up. Maybe if they can make you believe that you're beneath them, that makes them feel better about themselves. Adler would say that's something that we do to try to safeguard our own self-concept. Obviously, this is not a healthy thing. Once again, therapy is great for everybody. Also, withdrawal here is really someone who maybe when f is faced with a problem, they kind of run away from it or try to avoid it, right? And oftentimes we see this with people who have anxiety that it is very difficult to face problems and people do tend to try to avoid them. And then avoiding makes us feel better for short term, but it just makes the problem worse, okay? Another term here that is related to abnormal development is masculine protest. Masculine protest is the idea that we have, both in men and women, you find masculine protest in men and women both, it's the idea that we overemphasize the desirability of being male, for example here, right? So Adler would say that women are not truly inferior to men, but Adler would say that history has taught us to believe that women are inferior to men and that we are reinforced for that. We are reinforced for praising men. We are maybe punished for praising women in some ways. And so this contributes to an abnormal development. You can see how having beliefs that men and women are not equal could then hurt your relationship with other people and with humanity, can harm social interests, and therefore can cause abnormal development. All right, so getting into birth order, birth order is often what people think of when they think of Adler. Um, you'll see the term mentioned again later, family constellation, referring to the same idea here, that one of the things that you have no control over, but that does influence your personality, is whether you're an only child, firstborn, middle, or youngest child, right? And as you'll see, this is actually what our activity is going to be on this week. Once again, keeping in mind that our theories of personality are not created in a vacuum and that we are influenced by our own personal experiences. Keep in mind that Adler was a middle child who had a very intense rivalry with his healthier older brother. Having said all that, keeping all of that in mind, um, Adler had the idea that your birth order was a very important part of who you are.
So as we're going through and talking about these, think about your own personal family birth order as well as friends and other people that you know and try to see if there's some truth to this, right? So Adler would say that firstborn children, now to be a firstborn child here does not mean only child. It means a child that is born first and then has siblings come later. Adler would say that firstborn children typically receive excessive attention and pampering because the parents um, have no one else to pamper. If you're now the firstborn child and the other children haven't been born yet, their life is, at least to some degree, focused excessively on you. But the problem is then, when future children are born, the firstborn feels like they were dethroned. In other words, they are no longer the apple of their parents' eye. And now they might start to feel jealous towards children that were born later. So then, Adler would say that these individuals, because they have felt what it feels like to be pampered and then have that pampering removed, that's going to increase their feelings of inferiority. Now, what do we know, according to Adler, about feelings of inferiority? Well, feeling inferior makes you more likely to strive to try to compensate for that and that sometimes that's done in ways that are not healthy here, okay? So then firstborn children might be particularly anxious. Middle children, remembering that Adler himself was a middle child, um, Adler would say they're rarely pampered, even if they are, and now if we're talking about a middle child, we're talking about a child that has an older sibling and will, or already does have, will have a younger sibling as well. Adler would say that they're rarely pampered because they're not the firstborn child and that even if they are at the moment the youngest, they won't be the only child. There's already another child, so they're never going to receive complete attention. At the very least, they're going to receive divided attention. And that because they never have been pampered and they're the least likely to be pampered, then they might feel like they have to try to strive or they have to outdo their siblings. So then this might be the individuals who are perfectionists. This might be the ones that feel like they need to achieve because they feel like perhaps their older sibling might have been pampered for some period of time. Maybe they see a younger sibling being pampered currently but they don't feel like they were ever pampered and they're trying to beat out their other siblings, basically. So middle children, according to Adler, are the least likely to be pampered. Youngest children, according to Adler, are the most likely to be pampered. Um, youngest children, and now this dynamic might change a little bit depending on how many children are in the family. If we're talking about youngest children, um, we can be talking about a very small family or a very large family, but basically, when a parent knows that this is the last child, often they are babied a little bit. You hear that term. So then Adler would say that youngest children tend to be very dependent on their parents. And they are maybe more likely to have those like parasitic relationships that Adler mentioned earlier. Being very dependent on the parents and not wanting to separate. And then therefore, if they don't want to have relationships with other people, their social interest is going to be lower. So they might be more likely to have psychological issues, right? So then let's think about what only children would look like then. Only children, then, might have some kind of combination. They are like firstborn children in that they are the first experience their parents have uh, with parenting. And so they might be pampered excessively because they are firstborn. But then they also might be pampered excessively because they are the youngest. On the other hand, only children, likely, um, never have to compete with anyone else. So then maybe perhaps they have less motivation. Maybe they're less likely to strive. Maybe they're less likely to think about other people. Maybe they're used to having their needs met because they've never had to interact with another sibling. They've never had to compromise, right? So I don't know how much of a stock that you put into this theory. I, I do think birth order is important. I think the number of siblings that someone has does have a role in their personality, right? You can see this. When you have multiple children, I have two children, um, my children constantly have to at least in some ways think of each other, right? Even when it's one's birthday, we have to make sure the other one feels loved too and vice versa. And so there's always a compromise there, which I think is a good thing. I think they're having to learn to think about other people. But I don't know how much of an impact this would have. I mean, imagine why this is difficult to research. We can't randomly assign someone into the only child or youngest child 
um, role, for example. We can't do that. So we don't know. I don't know if my daughter was an only child or if my son was an only child. I don't know how that would change their personality because I can't see that. So it's difficult to study this. But I do want to hear your thoughts on this. So activity three, discuss your thoughts on Adler's birth order theory. Do you buy it? How much of a role do you think it plays? Do you think it's accurate? Do you think that firstborns truly are what Adler believed they are? Do you think middle children, youngest children, only children, is his theory accurate in your opinion? And then also bring it into your own personal birth order. So tell me what your role is. So just for full disclosure, I am the youngest of three. Um, so do you believe that your birth order impacted your personality? And if so, how? So I want to hear your thoughts on this theory and especially how you think it impacted your particular development. And you can also include examples of other people if you would like, um, friends, roommates, significant others, and if you believe this is true or not. So I look forward to reading those. All right, so when we're talking about Adler, what are we going to do with this information? Well, we talked about family constellations already. This is the idea of birth order. Uh, Adler also had the idea of something he called early recollections. To try to assess someone's early recollections, Adler would just say, tell me about your earliest memories. Now, remember that Adler emphasized subjective views of reality. It's not so much important that the person is telling you exactly what happened in the particular memory. Actually, according to Adler, the person probably is not giving you an accurate account. Maybe they believe that they are, but memories change over time, and we don't have perfect memories. But Adler would say someone describing their early memories, um, their early childhood to you, can tell you a lot about who they are now, that we tend to remember the things or look back on the things in life that we feel like are consistent with who we currently are. So you hear somebody say, well, I always knew that I was going to be a doctor because of this experience. Well, if that person had grown up to be a teacher, they might not remember the experience that was related to being a doctor, right? Um, so they might say, I always knew I wanted to have kids with this experience or something like that. Adler would say that we tend to look back and remember the things that led to where we are now. And we tend to color those memories with who we are now. Maybe we say, well, I always knew this. I always had this religious belief. I always had this political belief or whatever, even if we really didn't. So early recollections are important because it tells you something about who the person is right now. Not necessarily important because they're always completely accurate. Adler also did interpret dreams. He believed that dreams were often um, they often had a meaning, but they were often deceptive to individuals, and they were difficult for them to interpret. However, he didn't place as much of an emphasis on dream interpretation as uh, Freud did. So if we kind of review here what Adler has said, Adler has said that the most important part of your life is this striving to have social interest, to have good relationships, and to be at one with humanity. So then people who have psychological issues are people who are not comfortable in their relationships. So the goal of psychotherapy then, according to Adler, is going to be for the therapist to form a relationship with a client in a way that helps develop that client's social interest. Maybe we have to help the child, um, or I say child, but also adult, maybe we have to help them see that certain relationships are parasitic and help them to get away from those relationships. Maybe we have to help them deal with trust issues that maybe they developed because they were neglected. Um, whatever the case may be, we have to try to help people solve their issues with social interest. And typically, therapy is a great place to do that. Now, as we kind of close lecture today, thinking about Adler's theory, it is high on generating research. A lot of research has been done on Adler's theory. Um, it does make sense when we take what we know about people and it does guide action. There are practical things we could do here. We could take what Adler has to say, and we could try to use this to create psychotherapy techniques. Um, we could try to use this to understand people's personalities. It's moderate, moderate on parsimony. So remember that parsimony just means that a theory is simple, or at least it's not overly complicated. Um, so Adler's theory could probably be a little simpler, um, but it's fairly straightforward. It's low on verification, falsification, and internal consistency. I mean, as I said, thinking about the fact that 
it's really easy to look at someone's personality and say, okay, well, see, you're that way because you're a youngest child. But you can't prove that because you don't know what that person would be like if they were an only child or a firstborn child, for example, right? Um, it is sometimes difficult to do research on this kind of theory, but it is definitely interesting, and it has generated a lot of research here. So Adler's concept of humanity is very high on free choice. Now remember that Freud was high on determinism, that we don't necessarily have control over who we are. Because of the concept of creative power, Adler would say that we do have some control over who we are, um, which leads to some optimism there. It's also high on social factors. Obviously, relationships are important here. Um, uniqueness, that we are all different in a lot of ways. He does include an unconscious aspect to our personality, although he would say that it is working in combination with the conscious part of our personality. And this is very low on causality. Now, causality is a term I'm not sure if we've mentioned before this semester, but causality would be the idea that your past experiences determine who you are. And this is pretty low in Adler's theory. Adler would say that, yes, you're given building blocks based on your early environment and based on your biology, but what you do with that is up to you. Okay? All right, so that is the end of lecture for today. So look for the review video where I will talk more about the first exam. Remember that exam one is released on Monday, February 6th, and it'll be available until Monday, February 13th. It's going to be released at 12 p.m. noon on the 6th. It'll be due at 12 p.m. or noon on the 13th. Um, let me know if you have any questions. I recommend watching this video, doing the activity first, studying for the exam, uh, watch the review video, and then when you're ready for that, take the practice exam and then take the regular exam. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to come by my office hours. Um, remember that I will not be having office hours on February 13th, um, but other days between now and then would be great. Let me know if you need anything. Otherwise, I will talk to you guys next time.